Enrique Moises, thank you for joining us. A genicero is a new term for most of us. Who were the geniceros? The geniceros were a third of the population of what the people that we would call Hispanic New Mexicans today. They, what time period was that? In the late 1900s? By the, uh, by the, the census of 1790, yeah. these, these figures start popping out. Some of them specifically Genicero, and some you could identify them as Geniceros by the use of, uh, of, a, of a first name and not a last name. And, and certain professions were obviously servile professions because they were servants and slaves. So these were people who were captured and sold to families, to Hispanic families? Some, yeah, there, there were. There was definitely a market for uh, captives. Um, but there was also, by the late uh, uh, 18th century, uh, there was a governor, Tomas Velez Gachupin, that because the population was so big in, in the 18th century, had a, a vision of uh, establishing an outer ring of buffer settlements by two uh, Genisaro land grants, such as Belen, uh, um, Carnue, Las Huertas, uh, Abiquiu, San Miguel, San Miguel del Vado, just to name a few. So they were granted to the Genisaro families. These were land grants on sort of the buffer of the frontier and between the established settlements and yeah, I mean, a lot of times they were they were placed between, say, the, by Belen, by the uh, Apacheria of the South, uh, Carnue and Las Huertas, uh, which was the entrance, uh, Terrace Canyon, the entrance, uh, and the buffer lands, the borderlands of the Comancheria. You had Abiquiu, which was the buffer lands of the uh, of um, of the uh, Navajo and Ute territory, Provincia de Navajo. So uh, these were often definitely the, these communities were the borderlands. Um, you said that up to a third of our population by that census were considered Geniceros. So these were people who were dis slaves, were descendants of slaves who were captured and sold? Well, they weren't permanently slaves. They were, they were purchased, but uh, people would pay a ransom. People would rescue them. It was called a rescate, which mm -hmm. means rescue. And this, this brought on an, ab an obligation to also uh, Hispanicize them. They would learn Spanish. They would they would learn uh, Catholicism. They would learn whatever skills that that they could learn in in the families, and you could only hold them legally uh, for 15 years before uh, freeing them. Uh, others sought their freedom uh, by expressing the wish to marry. Uh, some women would get stuck in families permanently by having kids with the men in the families, and there's stuff in the in the, chron in the chronicles and the archives where you get, you'll get a 14-year-old woman uh, petitioning to marry her 15-year-old uh, um, boyfriend to get out of the family that she's been in uh, and just to, to d demanding her freedom through marriage. And so you get a, a sizable population of free Geniceros by, by the 1710, 1720. There's a largely unknown history in New Mexico about slavery. So who was uh, capturing, who were the people who were captured and who was doing the capturing and who was doing the selling? Well, there's um, a process. I mean, let's, let's, you know, one thing we need to remember that after the Pueblo Revolt, in the 1680, uh, uh, 1680 uh, you know, Pope released a lot of the uh, horses and a lot of the sheep that landed up being uh, uh, introduced to the Diné, the Navajo. Uh, the Comanches on the other side of the mountain range to the east uh, and the Utes thrived in, and changed their whole culture based on equestrian culture. By the, uh, after, by the early 1700s, there was massive raids by Ute and Comanche and, um, uh, and other tribes like the Kiowa. So uh, you had raids that were coming into the, into the Rio Grande, upper Rio Grande Basin and upper Rio Grande Valley. Uh, raiding pueblos and Hispanic settlements, then there was retaliated uh, retaliation raids. In this process, captive children were taken in both directions. Hmm. Um, as you uh, enter, as you establish buffer settlements like Abiquiu or Carnue, for example, then what happens is you have um, you have these these communities experiencing raids as their own, and they're also going off on retaliation retaliation raids. 
Um, so by, you, by the time you reach the 1800s or even the period of the Mexican period, which the Mexican period was probably the most unstable period, you even had more movements between groups of, through uh, retaliated raids between different groups. There was even a whole group of, of uh, the Navajo uh, nation called the Nakai Dene that takes its roots in captives that went the other way. Enrique, there was, even children were given as wedding presents. Can you talk about that? Young couples uh, upon marriage would, uh, would get a small child, a small Indian child as a wedding present. And to be a servant. To be uh, a companion to the future children of the family. Sometimes it worked out in very, very positive ways and sometimes it didn't. This was a common practice from the late 18th century in, clear into the late 19th century. What happened to the Hiniceros? We're still here. Um, <laughs> because you have uh, back here. Yeah, I'm from, the, mm -hmm. I'm from the land grant community of Las Huertas. I'm a member of the Las Huertas community on the uh, North Sandias, and the, I'm actually the president of the Cañon de Carnaval land grant. Uh, so a lot of people think, well, you know, or uh, historians will say, well, during the plan of uh, Igala that, um, uh, you know, th the category of Henisara was taken off and therefore everybody absorbed into being Mexican. And although that was the plan of the Mexican government to, to kind of erase uh, a particular specific indigenous identity as becoming uh, a, a Mexican state with a, a, with a, a, with a mestizo Mexican identity, uh, that didn't happen. You had... Uh, a lot of communities that still maintain their culture through ritual. So if you go to communities like Cañon de Carnue, will uh, you know, observe ritual dances such as the Matachines or the Comanchitos, or you go to places like Abiquiu. There was a lot of effort put forth by uh, even New Mexican uh, identity, uh, New Mexican education to create a mythical, uh, 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 basically the myth of the Spanish American identity. Um, and that's been fundamental of the school system to, um, within creating Hispanic identity, which is basically for those of us from the mountain land grant communities, uh, we, we are exposed, uh, every generation uh, is exposed to the history and legacy of this inter, uh, inter exchange with Apache people and Comanche people, at least specifically in my community. Talk about some of the rituals that are still celebrated even today in communities that trace their history to the Hianiceros. And we have some photos. I mean, you mentioned uh, La Madera. That remembers a time and place where, uh, well, through the Sandia communities, when uh, the men would leave on the buffalo hunts in October and the women would have to basically defend communities such as La Madera, San Antonio, um, uh, San Antonio de Paulo along North 14, the men would leave on the hunts and they would come back in October right before Christmas. There's an initiation of captives that were traded uh, probably with, Com uh, with Comanches that were captive from other, other tribes that were brought in. And this is um, a ritual dance that uh, initiates captives into the community that are brought into community. Enrique, what about in Abaqui? We have a photo as well of one of the ceremonies. Or... Yeah, uh, captives are a theme in all of these uh, celebrations. And again, the as Moises was saying, the Henisero identity is undisturbed. It, it's, it's continuous in these land-grant communities that were a long ways uh, from the valleys uh, and the main population in many cases. The majority of Geniceros uh, assimilated into Hispano, uh, Nuevo Mexicano uh, culture and community, and, and some assimilated into Pueblo communities as well. And so the majority of this one third of the population uh, becomes Hispano, becomes Pueblo. But the, the communities, these Genisaro communities uh, celebrate captives because that's the main theme. You can, if you go to a a dance in Abiquiu, you can get taken captive yourself and then someone has to pay your rescue. Um, uh, I own... So if I go, I, you were saying you own what? <laughs> I own uh, an ethnomusicologist by the name of uh, Brenda Romero. 
we were in Abiq together, and she was captured. And uh, p people say, "Is anybody? Can anybody vouch for her? Does anybody know this India?" And I said, "I do." And and I bought her for five dollars. And it's it's a pantomime, and it's it's satirical at this point. Up in ranchos, you see a lot of captive taking as well, uh, even with adults. And the dances actually honor the, the captives as they bring them into uh, the culture. How does the story of the Geniceros challenge our current understanding of New Mexico identity? I think what's a very important to understand is that it upsets the uh, tricultural myth. The tricultural myth is that you know, three, three cultures, uh, his, a Pueblo, Hispano, and Anglo live in this simultaneous um, uh, harmony. And it kind of uh, erases the historical violence that happened through uh, iterations of colonialism. Henisado identity places itself out of that tricultural myth and it braces indigenous identity and the realization of violence and trauma. Um, and the ways in which we remember um, a, a, a violent colonial history. Uh, and then it, it, it envisions a futuristic identity that says we can, we can continue to exist outside of this tricultural myth and we can challenge these notions. And meanwhile, we refuse to be rendered by the state and we render ourselves um, through our own ritual and our own relationships and our own history um, with each other. Well, I want to thank you both for coming and talking about this. It's really fascinating. <laughs>